Michael Orsi. I'm your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which brings you the big G for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the little G, all the good things that people do to put that gospel of life into action. And uh, the word gospel itself uh, comes from Mark's gospel. It means good news. And we uh, certainly live in a world where we do need good news. But oftentimes the, uh, the good news gets uh, played down. As a matter of fact, it gets uh, distorted. And in some places, the good news is even they try to snuff it out. In order for us to lead good lives, in order for us to truly respect human life, which is the reason that this program exists, we have to be grounded in scriptural principles. Now, we have a very interesting program today, a little bit different from anything else that we've ever done, because it involves apologetics. Big, big word, but you know what it means? It doesn't mean to apologize, like I'm sorry, but it means to explain, to explain. And we have a gentleman here. His name is Michael Bossman. And Michael is the CEO and president of Why to Believe. Why to Believe. And uh, he has developed this program especially for young people who, he says, go to school from, from high school, college, even graduate school, where there is an attempt to remove God's word from the curriculum or, or and even more dastardly, to try to convince people that the word of God is wrong. How foolish to believe in the Bible. It's only some ancient writing of some superstitious people. It never really happened. Do you really believe that? Do you really want to live your life according to biblical principles? And so Michael has developed this wonderful program, which uh, he brings into the public high schools and colleges, and then tries to develop leaders in those places that can continue his work even when he moves on to another environment. Now, I have a lot of questions for Michael. The first one is, how do you get into the public schools? <laughs> Well, that's a great question, Father. Uh, there are Christian ministries that actually operate in the, inside the public school system, and we partner with those existing ministries and then come in as experts, uh, if you will, on this uh, study of apologetics and help them to uh, address the big questions of life, the big questions that young people are asking. And so that's kind of how we get in. And, okay, let me, uh, let's go back a step. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. They let you in. I mean, they say, hey, okay, you could come in and give a talk. You can come in and start a club. Yes, exactly. In other words, uh, for example, we work with uh, locally here uh, in Southwest Florida. Um, the the Florida Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, has a presence on different uh, middle schools and high schools here in the Southwest area. And so we work with them. We also have some relationships developing with other ministries. Uh, certainly with the Christian schools that exist, uh, those are easy ones. Uh, but the public school system is really where, where we're focusing our efforts because we feel that's where you're gonna reach the broadest segment of uh, people who would uh, otherwise perhaps never consider uh, religion and, and Christianity and specifically. And so, we want to discuss these big questions of life with these young people. Okay, and well, how, do you, perspective. how do you yeah. get in? You call up the principal and say, hello, my, this is uh, uh, Michael Bosman. I want to yeah. talk uh, about uh, why you should believe. Yes, well, here's how it works. Um, they have meetings uh, on a weekly basis inside the public school system. So they'll usually have them just 15 minute meetings, usually at lunchtime, sometimes before school, sometimes after school. Wait, when you say that, you know, they usually have meetings. Who, you know, you call the principal, uh, principal says to you, what? Ah, uh, no, I actually don't even speak to the principal. Okay, who do you talk so to? 
Yeah, so so the Fellowship of Christian Athletes right. is a ministry that exists. Yes. Um, yes, and they already have an existing club on that campus. That's okay, operating. so you go to an existing week. club. Yes. Okay, yes, good. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we're, we come in as specialists into their meetings and then talk with them about these issues. What is truth? Uh, how would you know truth if you saw it? Uh, is the Bible trustworthy? Uh, what about the problem of evil? These are all questions that young people have, and it starts with this foundational idea of truth. And uh, that's where we begin our discussions. Okay, let me uh, ask you this. Mm -hmm. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes already has a presence in the school, and student-led clubs are permitted in the public school system. Student-led clubs, correct? Correct. Okay. Student yes, okay. Precisely. So then you get in touch with them, their leadership, and they invite you to come to the school uh, during lunch period, or uh, they have some time that they set aside for these type yes. of organizations. All right. Yes. Wonderful so far. But I want to uh, ask you, um, what kind of a crowd do you attract? So word gets out, hey, you know, we're going to have uh, Why to Believe is coming today. Uh, how many how many young people show up? Uh, it varies uh, depending on the school system. Anywhere from uh, a dozen to uh, two hundred. Wow! Uh, it really depends on, on the the individual school, um, and we go in with the exact same uh, message at each school. We do this over a four week period of time, so we have four different topics that we discuss. And uh, we promote them in advance. So one of the things we encourage the students to do before we get there, we leave them little three by five cards that have got the subject matter that we'll uh, be discussing in the uh -huh. upcoming weeks. And it's got a place for them to write in both the time and the location, room 1101 at 1145 AM next Tuesday, right? And so they then hand these out to their friends and say, hey, we're gonna have a guy coming in to discuss what evidence is there that God exists. Okay, look, folks, you see how simple this is? There are organizations already in many of the schools, like Fellowship of Christian Athletes. They're there. Mr. Bossman gets in touch with them. Hey, could we come over and talk to the students? They say, sure, come on over. Then they begin to advertise it, and the students do a lot of the, the advertising. So it, it's kind of like a, a, a ready-built structure that you have. Right? Yes. Now, why did you get into this ministry? Is the faith of children being attacked in the public school system, or is it just being ignored? It is certainly being attacked, certainly. Tell us and about the attacks. What are the attacks? Yes, well, it's not uncommon for a, a Christian, for example, to walk on to either a high school or a college campus, even in middle school now and uh, usually approached by somebody, someone who is not a believer, and they'll ask this question. I've always wanted to ask a Christian this. I notice I can see you got a cross around your neck and that you're a Christian. And I'm just curious, if God exists, why did he create evil? It seems to me that either God's not omnipotent, like you say that he is, and he can't stop evil, or he is omnipotent, like you say that he is, and he can stop evil, but he does not do so, he's cruel. So either way, why do you worship this God? About that time, the student stammers and says, late for class, see you later, I got to go, right? That one encounter won't destroy their faith, but they get this on a daily basis. It's so a this is organized? It, would you say this is something that's organized by a secularists, atheists? It, exactly. In other words, there are secular people. It used to be that atheists sat line and just felt sorry for us Christians because they said, well, there is no such thing as God, and you guys just believe in a fantasy, and they were happy to sit on the sidelines. Today, that's not the case. They take it to our students. They take it especially to those who have a profession of faith and try to destroy their faith. Now, just to give you the statistics, there's been the Barna Research is a great Christian organization that's done a lot of research in this area. And I'll, and I'll give your viewers some startling statistics. This is why I got involved in what I do here. I'm an engineer by trade. That's what I did in my career. And I'm trained in, I got a master's degree in apologetics. But upon learning this is what I what really drove me to get involved in what's, what's happening with young people today. Three quarters of Christian 
children. These are children that grew up in the church, went through our youth programs, will completely abandon their faith in their first year of college, three quarters. Now you might say, well, sometimes students are young and they get wild and they sow some wild oats and then they get married and have children and come back to church. Okay, what you're telling me though yes. is that this is really uh, an organized effort to Absolutely. destroy the faith of young people. And then you're telling me something else which is uh, astounding. You know, I know that young people sometimes fall away from their uh, formal religious practice, let's put it that way. But you're telling me now that the fundamental beliefs in God and in Scripture are being undermined and that we're losing in the first year of college 75%? Yes, staggering. staggering. It is staggering. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and as an engineer, I, I, I said, oh, sure, that must be wrong. I have to investigate these statistics because people can make statistics say whatever they want to, right? And I know how to distort statistics for, for a purpose. And so I said, let me look into this and see how bad it really is. In fact, when I did some up, update on the research, it's actually worse. It's probably closer to 85% today. Okay. Now, this um, undermining of faith begins, you said, in middle school. Yes. And sure. then it's, you know, it, it, it continues all the way through uh, middle school, high school, and, and college. Yes, right. absolutely. And have you ever collected uh, the, um, the attacks that they level uh, against faith and say, this I'm is sure. where they begin? Tell us, okay, do you believe in God? You said, yeah, well, God, does he create evil? Uh, do you believe in God that allows evil to happen? What, what then happens? What are the steps that they go through to undermine faith? Well, let's start with, at the very beginning. As early as first grade, they begin getting instructions, uh, questions, uh, you know, age specific. So each time the questions get a little more challenging, a little, they have to think. So we're back in grammar school now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, this is serious. Pay attention to this show. This starts when they're little, little, little kids. Okay, continue. Yes. As, as young as, 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 certainly, even into the kindergarten ages, they can start this. Now, what they'll do is, is they'll pose some sort of question and so then ask the, the question that they ask, or they'll met, pose, pose a situation, and then they'll ask, and it's usually something associated with a moral question, and they'll, and they'll ask, is this fact or opinion? Fact or opinion. So there's, there's only two answers here, fact or opinion. What they're taught is things like science, things that are repeatable, things that you get the same answer every time you, you know, in, in investigate this, always comes up the same. Well, those are facts. Anything else? Opinion. Now, why is that important? Because if only science is factual, then Everything that you believe and I believe and everything that anybody believes, you use the word, I, and I give an example, usually when I start off with the middle or high school students, I'll ask them a question, can something be both fact and opinion? Now, for most of them, they've never had to say, could it be both? But they've been asked this question, fact or opinion, fact or opinion. And I'll say, can something be fact or, and an opinion? And they'll say, no, it has to be either a fact or an opinion. That's the usual answer to which I respond. Okay, I'm going to make a statement. You tell me if this is fact or opinion. I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. Half of the students will holler out fact and the other half will say opinion <laughs> and then they'll start arguing with each other no 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 it's a it's a fact because George Washington was the first president and then others will say yeah but he said he, he believes that means it's opinion that's very subtle but it's very important to understand so what they say is father I can see that this is very important to you this Christian thing that you believe that God exists and this is important for your life. And I understand that, that's wonderful. You see, that's true for you, it's not true for me. I have my own truth. Now, if your audience can't recognize right now, and a red flag didn't just go off in their mind saying, wait a second, that's a logical impossibility. 
then they need to study apologetics. They need to understand why do we believe what we believe? And why do I say that? That particular question, I get that often from students. And I'll just take you through a dialogue that we would have. I would say, well, now that's interesting. Tell me what it is that you believe. And they'll often say they do believe in God and they just believe God is a God of love. And I do more good things than bad things. So I think if, if heaven really exists, that'll let me in. To which I reply, well, you know, Jesus said something in Matthew 14, chapter six, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. So it seems to be that Jesus was saying, you could be a really good person and not go to heaven. So there's only three possible problem or answers to this conundrum that we have, because you said you have truth and I believe I have truth. So there's only three possibilities here rationally. Either you do have truth and I don't, or I have truth and you don't, or you know what? We could both be wrong, couldn't we? We could both not have truth. But you just said you have truth and I have truth. That's not even rationally possible. That's an irrational statement. And okay, now, do you have, your face and say, do you have wow, a curriculum? I, yeah, I never thought about that, right? What you want to do is engage them with questions that they can then wrestle with these ideas and say, well, yeah, I guess that's true. Hey, that's a, that, tell me. Let me, that, that's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of philosophy, yeah. though. You yes, know, you have to. Is. Yeah, and a, a, a lot of uh, young people, I mean, uh, they, they, their minds are, are not yet formed so as, so as to be able to philosophize and right. and to think rationally. Now you're training them to think rationally. Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, so you're telling me up to that point, their education is. Uh, not really a good education. They're not thinking rationally. They're they're parroting uh, what they heard, uh, or they they've been diminished uh, in in so far as um, how to think correctly. In okay. essence, that's correct. I want to help them to think through why do you why do you believe what it is that you believe, and is it true? Most importantly, is it actually true? Because they believe. See, they just made that statement. I'm glad that's true for you. It's not true for me. I have my own truth. Believing that truth is this amorphous thing that you can just make up. So if I decide tomorrow uh, I feel more feminine today than I did yesterday, and I think I'm a girl today, they just say, "Well, that's your truth." Well, that's you know something that our society is really uh, inundated with today. Uh, yes. We we create the truth, our own truth. What what what's my? That's your truth. That's my truth. We just we just make it up. Uh, right. As a matter of fact, you know, people don't even care about facts anymore. <laughs> you know, they don't care about facts. You just make up a truth. Imagine producing this wonderful program, Action for Life. It costs a great deal of money. We're going to need your help. So if you would like to donate to keep this good news program on the air, please, please go to your computer, your cell phone, actionforlife.net. Our thought for the day, I hope that all of you have Bibles in your home. The Bible is the Word of God. and There's nothing more powerful than God's Word. Keep it in a prominent place to remind you that you are part of God's good news and that God is using you to do His will. Now, you go through a philosophical process with them. You talk about history. You talk about science. When do you begin to tell them about Jesus, because you built now a foundation on philosophy, on history. Yes. And 
their faith in Jesus has certainly been rattled. Their faith in God has been rattled. Okay, yes. so do you have a curriculum whereby you say, okay, we built a foundation philosophically, historically, uh, scientifically. Now let's talk about the supernatural revelation. The fact is that there is a God and that he sent his son to redeem us. How do you get to that? It's very simple. What we do, we end every single discussion with a brief one slide on the resurrection. Did the resurrection happen? This is important, folks. As St. Paul says, if we don't believe in the resurrection, we're the biggest of fools. Okay, go ahead. So we actually lay out what can we know? What are the things that all scholars, even skeptics, will acknowledge about the resurrection? At least the apostles believed that they saw the risen Christ and it transformed their lives and they began preaching very soon after the resurrection. We know those to be a, a factual claim. We know, for example, the tomb was empty. No one disputes that. No one does. Not any, even the most skeptical scholar that's not Christian or doesn't believe in even in God will acknowledge, yes, the tomb was empty. So we take known facts. We have people like James, Jesus' brother, right? Did he, his, his half-brother, did, did, did James have a trans, uh, transformed life? Absolutely. He was skeptical. He shows up in the beginning with his mother, and they try to tell Jesus, please come home, right? You, you're, you're, they're going to kill you, right? And what does he say? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers, right? Those who follow me and follow my teachings are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. He's teaching a lesson, right? But they're skeptics. Paul, the greatest persecutor of Christians when he was a Jew, he thought that, uh, that, that Christianity was destroying Judaism, and he went out to persecute and kill as many Christians as possible. So These you're telling us the proof, the proof of the resurrection is not the empty tomb, okay? Because we could say that there was a Jimmy Hoffa pulled over there. He just dis his body was stolen. But... The resurrection is based on not just the testimony, but the fact that this testimony came from people whose lives were changed because of an experience with the risen Lord. And Precisely. they gave their lives to promote the teaching of Jesus Christ because they believed on the basis of the encounter with the risen Lord, the resurrection, road to Emmaus, having a breakfast by the seashore with uh, Peter and James and John, this is true. Yes. And they stake their very lives on it. Now, when you tell that to these young people, what do they say? We can look at how the apostles died, almost all of them tragically and horribly, that we know thousands of, of Christians in the first century went to their deaths rather than recant. I mean, when Paul says in chapter 15, we were just talking chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, when he says, first he was seen by Peter, and then by the 12, and then ultimately by me, and he adds a little note, and actually 500 other of his followers, many of whom are still alive today. Now, the minute Paul makes this statement to the Corinthians, the Jews, who are still persecuting Christians and, and, and trying to stamp them out, they would have gone and found every single one of those witnesses and said, all right, tell me the truth. Did you really see something? Every, all they had to do was produce one, one single person that stood up and said, yeah, they gave me 30 denarii to say that I never saw anything. And Christianity is done, finished, right? It gets wiped out in the first century. They can't find a single witness. All of them go to horrific deaths rather than recant. When you have young people saying, uh, I don't know about raising somebody from the dead. Where's the proof? And Mr. Bossman is giving us the proof. Who would risk their life, give their life for something that was not true? Now, it could be one person who has psychological issues, could be, but all of them? I don't think so. I don't think so. And so you could see that, you know, uh, these uh, gospel narratives of the resurrection aren't just, you know, little stories that uh, people of faith shared with each other, and maybe they believed, and maybe they didn't believe, they had different degrees of belief. 
But this is hardcore evidence that this indeed did happen and they were willing to suffer and die for it. Now what we do with that information, we set those baselines so you can't, in other words, I'm presenting facts that, that if they're going to argue with me, I can respond and say, do you know that even the skept most skeptical scholars in the world would agree with, you're going against all scholarship, all known scholarship, when you disagree with any one of these facts. Once I've established that fact, we present the gospel. That's our point at which we share the gospel. And I'll tell you, this is fantastic. This inside the public school. We are sharing the gospel every single time. We give students an opportunity to accept Christ. This is, this is what you're saying is right just fantastic. Uh, I, I think that it's so important for our young people to hear the message that you're presenting to them as to how they remain strong in their faith and why their faith is built on solid rock. It's not built on sand, as the scriptures say. And, and that way, they have something to uh, hold on to as they go through their years of education, maybe challenge what's being said to them in the classroom or by fellow students, and then bring that with them into the rest of their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, we say this program is about the big G, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important that we know the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. It is based on fact. I want to thank you, Mr. Bossman, Michael Bossman, for being with us today. Good luck uh, with the continuation of this wonderful program that you have, Why to Believe. In the meantime, see you next week. I'm for action, and I hope you are too. We would like to thank our generous sponsors for their wonderful support. Thanks for watching. Please join us next time for Action for Life. I'm for action and I hope you are too. I'm Father Michael Orsi. I am your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the big G and the little G, all the good things that people are doing to put the gospel of life into action. So please join us for the next episode of Action for Life.